G'day, g'day How you going? What do you know? He'll strike a light G'day, g'day And how you going? Just say g'day, g'day, g'day And you'll be right We're going to carry off where we left off on Good Friday uh, from Matthew chapter 28. And the title of this message is Encountering the Resurrection of Christ and the Empty Tomb. As you're making your way there, on a practical note, which we will get to toward the end of the message, is what difference does this make in my life, the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And so we're going to consider what this means. So Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 8. It says, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guard shook of fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word and as we study this passage of Scripture about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we see what happened that uh, morning that changed the course of history, I pray that we would look at this with fresh eyes and fresh understanding and and those who don't know you as Savior and Lord, that they would encounter and experience this resurrection and uh, see the empty tomb as positive proof of what you said you would do. So we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. The words, he is not here, he is risen, has changed the course of history. No event in history comes close to this change of history with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the crowning event in God's redemptive history. It's the cornerstone of Christianity. It's the foundation of the gospel. The resurrection of Jesus is the final provision that guarantees the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. You see, the core of the gospel message is the fact that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And it's not just a historical fact, an undeniable fact in history, and just a mere footnote in history, but it has an eternal reality which has a powerful impact upon our daily lives. It is something that you embrace by faith and which you take your stand. And every true believer in Christ knows that Jesus died for our sins. After all, that's the bedrock of the gospel message. But what few appreciate is that the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has much to do with your salvation as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The two go in hand in hand. So Jesus dying on the cross for our sins is half the gospel. The other half the gospel is that he rose again to prove that the acceptable sacrifice uh, before the Father. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ means the cross of Christ worked and that it's complete and that Christ's resurrection sealed the atonement on the cross. And uh, it was a declaration of the work of salvation that was complete for all time. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 4, it says, Jesus declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the empty grave is God's seal of approval upon um, this gospel itself and upon the Son. You see, it sealed the victory. And uh, the declaration of the good news is now open to all. You see, friends, the empty tomb is the greatest evidence of the resurrection. 
And throughout time, as we know, there's been critics and skeptics who have tried to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But no one can disprove it. No one can disprove the Bible, for that matter, as well. The empty tomb still stands as evidence to all that Jesus is not dead and that he is alive. And so as we look at our text today, we want to come back and to try to experience what it was like for those who were first onto the scene with these ladies uh, that uh, uh, we just read about a few moments ago. Try to imagine what these women were feeling and experiencing and that, uh, how they must have felt. Again, no doubt they probably felt emotionally drained. They probably were weary and numb and perhaps uh, due to the grief and their lack of sleep, uh, their hearts had been crushed by the tragedy of what took place. And so fresh in their mind was the great suffering of Jesus, their friend, their teacher, their deliverer, the healer. And so life would be unbearable without the comfort of the one that they love so dearly. And the awful scenes of Friday were still etched in their minds and inscribed in their hearts and uh, in their minds, and it was unforgettable of what took place on Good Friday. And so they arose early Sunday morning with the sad task of anointing the body of Jesus for a proper burial because it was a kind of a rush job. They had to get him off the cross before the Sabbath, and so they, they did a pretty quick job to get him into the tomb. And so as they approach the tomb, no doubt they're thinking and going through all the uh, situation that happened in their mind, the brutal treatment at the hands of the harsh and cruel Romans. And they can probably still hear in the back of their minds the cracking of the whip. And they can see his blood flowing all over the place. And they can probably feel the damp, threatening darkness that was going to cover the earth as it convulsed at the sight of its creator being crucified. And they could smell the, the spices that was going to be for the, the burial used to anoint the dead. And they were reliving what took place on Friday. And so each of the gospel accounts, when you go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you see these pictures of the women coming in. And so they arrived early in the morning, before the sun came up, before the dawn, as verse 1 mentions. And so these ladies, they had seen the tune before because they followed uh, Joseph of Arimathea and the others that put Jesus in this tomb. They saw him taking the body down just days before. They had to return back to their homes because of the Sabbath drew near. And so they went home and they prepared some spices and ointments where they wanted to have the next opportunity to go to the tomb and to rewrap and to anoint the body uh, of Jesus. And so you got to admire their passion and their courage and their devotion and how they love the Lord. And uh, they're thinking he, he's got to have a proper burial. And it's the least that they can do. And so they were brave in what they did. They weren't afraid of the darkness or uh, being identified with a Christ follower or even afraid of the, the Roman soldiers that were there to guard the tomb. And so they came to the tomb and and uh, they're going to expect to see a body there. And uh, they came there to anoint the body of Jesus with spices and ointments, uh, but they were unable to do, as we mentioned, because the Sabbath drew near on that, on that Friday. But something happened. Something different happened than what they expected. These ladies came, and they saw the place where they had placed the body of Jesus. And they were probably discussing on their way there, how are we going to move this stone away from the tomb? Again, you couldn't ask the Roman soldiers because they were there to guard it and to protect it. And so their major concern was access to the body. And of course, these ladies, again, they had no confidence of the Roman soldiers that they had been dispatched to uh, guard the tomb. And it would be uh, you know, for them to be courteous enough to roll it away. But we see this encounter that we just read about, uh, and they're confronted with this situation that happened where the tomb becomes open and empty. And again, the Bible teaches that after the professional executioners crucified Jesus, they placed the body into that tomb. They originally wrapped the body in about 40 uh, kilos or about 100 or 75 pounds of spices. So it's really he wasn't able to revive himself, which is a theory that some people have. But um, 
and also this very large stone estimated to weigh about one to two tons that rolled in front of it. And so this boulder was in place. A group of 16 or so uh, Roman soldiers, centurions, were there to secure the tomb. So this was obviously uh, an issue that they had to confront with. And these centurions were fighting machines. Uh, They were gladiators. They were trained to protect the area of the tomb against an entire battalion and an attack or a mob. You don't mess with these guys. And again, they had a seal on this particular tomb. And despite all these precautions, the stone, the soldiers, the seal, the tomb was empty that Easter morning. And so when the first people arrived to peer in, they saw only one thing, the blood-stained burial cloths, and as Jesus has materialized right through them, as you'll see in the other gospel accounts. But the empty tomb uh, serves as a powerful testimony of the resurrection of Christ. And critics, again, uh, down through the centuries, have tried to refute it. And they have different theories. Uh, One of them would be, well, the disciples stole the body. But this seems far-fetched when you consider these disciples were cowards. They ran away. They they hid. They fled. Uh, They couldn't have overpowered these armed soldiers. Uh, And to roll away this you know, one to two ton boulder and dispose of the body and then manufacture a myth about the resurrection, a myth that they would die for. It doesn't seem plausible. Another possibility that others have come up with, well, the religious leaders disposed of the body of Jesus. And this has some serious flaws in it as well. If they had removed the body, all they would have to do is parade it down the streets in Jerusalem. Here's the body of Jesus. And it would have discounted the whole resurrection from the very start. But they couldn't produce the body. Because the body is no longer dead, Jesus has been raised back to life. And as you know, that Christianity rises and falls on the resurrection. It's one of the silent and infallible witnesses, this resurrection, the empty tomb. And again, critics cannot explain it away. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then where's his body? And leaders of every other religion, they've died and they've stayed dead in their graves. Their bones are decaying in the ground, but not with Jesus. He claimed that he would rise from the dead on the third day, and that's exactly what Jesus did. The empty tomb validates his claim. Now notice what took place, and this brings a lot of clarification, what happened. Notice verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. And the guard shook of fear of him, and he became like dead men. Now, this earthquake that you see here, it wasn't strong enough to roll the stone away, nor was it uh, strong enough to destroy the the tomb. Uh, When the earthquake happened there, a lot of people just wondering what happened here. Is everyone okay? And most likely it shook people and got up. And this was God's way of really drawing attention to the empty tomb. And again, the event of Jesus' death was still fresh in everyone's minds. The town of Jerusalem was still packed because of the Passover. People came from all over the nations to come and celebrate Passover that day. And they remember there was another earthquake that happened on Good Friday. Uh, and that was a moment when the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom because God the Father was the one that tore the, the veil. So this aftershock some three days later Those that were working perhaps in the temple wondering, okay, what's it this time? And uh, the last time we had the significant event, the veil was torn. So what's going on this time? But we see the angel here that moved the stone and sitting on it. So it wasn't the earthquake that moved the stone. It was the angel that moved the stone that came from heaven. So the angel's appearance, again, we see was so bright, so light, that it was like looking at lightning. And those who have seen lightning, just it's such a bright flash that goes uh, before us. And so it's important to understand that the purpose of the angel rolling back the stone is not to let Jesus out, but it was to let others peek in and see the empty tomb. Jesus, in his resurrected state, as you know, can walk through walls. 
In John's Gospel, there's a situation in chapter 20 that says that Jesus suddenly appeared to the disciples that they were in a locked room. Jesus came out of the tomb even when the stone was rolled over it because he can walk through things like that. So it wasn't the tomb was open and then he walks out. Finally, I can walk out now. That wasn't how it happened. He already resurrected. He already left the tomb before the angel came and moved the stone away. So that brings a lot of clarification to this tomb story. And so what they found again as they rolled the stone away, the empty tomb, and praise the Lord, the Lord answered their prayers. Because they're probably wondering, on their way there, how's, how are we going to move the stone away? The Lord answered that prayer. He sent an angel and moved the stone. Now the text mentions, starting in verse 5, the angel said to them, it says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, but he is risen. As he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So here the angel announced the good news of the resurrection, and he gave them four messages, as you notice there. The first message was, don't be afraid. And that's the reality of the resurrection. It brings joy, not fear. So when you're afraid, remember the empty tomb. The second message there is that he is not here. So again, Jesus isn't dead, and uh, he, he's not to be looked among, um, uh, among the dead. Uh, he's alive. The third message was come and see. So the women can come and check out the evidence themselves. And so the tomb was empty, and it's still empty today. The resurrection is a historical fact. And then fourthly, notice it says to go quickly and tell. So they are to spread the joy of the resurrection. And we too are to spread the good news of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the resurrection. The church would have dismantled. There's no Bible. There's nothing if the resurrection didn't happen. And I believe these women... Uh, like many people expected to see Jesus there, because they've never seen people rise from the dead. Again, Jesus raised Lazarus, but that was Jesus raising Lazarus. But now you have this man who is dead and crucified. They didn't expect to, you know, Jesus to prove who he said he was, but again, uh, it happened. In Luke's account in chapter 24, verse 5 says, Why do you look, among the living, uh, look for the living among the dead? And so the point is that the Seeing the empty tomb is a reminder that we don't worship a dead martyr, but we worship a living God. So once we realize that the tomb is empty and Jesus did rise from the dead, then God tells us to tell others, which is, in fact, at the end of uh, Matthew's Gospel, you see the Great Commission, you know, to go and tell others the, the good news. And I suspect one of the reasons that Jesus asked them to meet with the disciples in Galilee, as you notice in the text there, and not in Jerusalem, because Galilee was a comfort zone for them. This is where they, they grew up. This is where they're from. And it was away from these religious leaders. It was away from the mob. And uh, what you do see later on, and 45 days later, after Jesus ascended and the church uh, is born, uh, is that the disciples and Peter and the disciples were back in Jerusalem preaching at the temple. But sometimes during those nervousness and the shyness, you, you take a step back, go into your comfort zone, and then you pray and you take some steps forward. And this is kind of what I see happening here. Jesus commanding them to go back to that Galilee, to their comfort zone, get encouragement, and then get sent out. But notice what took place in verse 8. And so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Now, I'm sure that joy and excitement is not the uh, ex, you know, uh, feelings that you go from a graveside or a funeral. That's not a typical feeling when you go to a, a funeral or, or a, a graveside. Usually we leave with pain and grief uh, over death of a family member or a friend, and even if it's not someone that was close to us. Uh, again, excitement is not the typical emotion when you leave a funeral or a graveside. And yet these ladies went out with great joy. Their source of excitement, of course, was that Jesus rose. That makes all the difference. And that's the thing, my friends, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
allows us to have a different view of death. Death is no longer something that we must face with dread or despair. Uh, Death is no longer the enemy for those who believe in Jesus Christ because Jesus conquered sin and death. And because he lives, we shall live also. His victory over death brings deliverance now and glory to come. The passion of Christ, his death, would have have been without any purpose if it were not for the resurrection. It boils down to this, my friends. And the devil, as you know, he thought he had won. Once Jesus was crucified and his body was limp on the cross and, um, and removed his lifeless body from the cross and laid it in the tomb, secured and sealed and guarded by the Roman soldiers. The, the enemy, Satan, thought he had won this battle. But surprise! Death and the grave cannot hold Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as you read through the Gospels, you see how Jesus, he made a lot of interesting statements and a lot of interesting claims when he was here. He said things like, I am God. He said, I am the only way to heaven. I am the Savior of the world. Those are some heavy statements. And again, a lot of people say, well, Jesus is a good person. He is a a good teacher, a prophet, or something else like that. But a good teacher and a good leader is not going to say, I'm God, and I'm the Savior of the world. But Jesus is who he said he is, or he's the biggest liar that ever lived. When he said, I am God, you also see people worshipped him. As you go throughout the Gospel accounts, you see people worshipped him. And he made some claims, and he said that what I'm going to do, I'm also going to validate my claim. In fact, if you read in John's Gospel, chapter 2, Uh, One day when he cleared out the money changers in the temple because it turned into this massive marketplace where people were selling things and doing all kinds of uh, stuff instead of worshiping the Lord, uh, he went and drove them all out. And this upset the religious leaders at the time. And they were saying and accusing him, what right do you have to do with this? And he says, well, because I'm God, essentially. And they said, prove it. And he says, I will. After they kill me, I'll rise again on the third day. And that's exactly what he did. He claimed to be God, and the resurrection backs up what he claimed. And as you know, the passage in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's a strong claim. Wouldn't you agree? He said, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways, or I'm a good way, or I'm one way. He said, I am the way. You know, and, and there's a lot of people who say, well, all roads lead to heaven. No, that's wrong, that's false, and that's stupid. It's like saying, I can dial any number and I'll get to my home line. That's not going to work. And he said, I am the truth. And that means, and listen carefully, any other way is not the truth if Jesus is right. There's only one truth. If he is the truth, then everything else is false. He claimed to be God. And he said that no one can come to the Father except by me. That's pretty clear. There's only one way into heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, all power and authority is, uh, in heaven is given to me. Why? Because he's God. He can do everything that God can do. In fact, we even saw in John chapter 18, uh, 10, verse 18, on Friday, where it says, uh, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. You see, friends, no force can keep Jesus in the tomb. Yes, the Romans killed him. Yes, he was placed in a tomb. But the big stone uh, was put in front of him and sealed. But they're only trying to prevent the inevitable. For Jesus to come out of the tomb and rise again on the third day. As Jesus says, I give my life away, I take it up again. Now, hypothetically, and we know hypotheticals never happen, but if he is dead, then everything that we believe comes crashing down. We're wasting our time. We might as well pack up and go home. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus himself is no better than the tens of other thousands of uh, those who have claimed to be sent from God. If it's not true and that there is no resurrection from the dead, then the very system belief that we cherish so deeply is nothing more than another religion that offers life and hope to no one. If Jesus is still in the tomb, then our way of life is a disgrace, it's deception, and among the, we're some of the greatest fools that ever walked upon the earth, if that is true. 
If Jesus is dead, then our system belief is dead. The foundations have crumbled beneath us, and we and like we said, just we're wasting our time right now. But you see, the fact of the matter is Jesus rose from the dead. He was resurrected. The tomb is empty. He did what he promised. And when Jesus makes a promise, you can count on it. It will be fulfilled. Because Jesus rose from the dead, he is who he said he was. He has the power, as he said he had, and he kept that promise to come. Now, that we've encountered the empty tomb, and again, in past uh, Easter services, we've, we've proven and di- given all the other evidences of it. And we've seen the resurrection and what it means. But now let's take it to a personal. What does it mean to us? So what? What does it matter? What does it mean to me? What is the power of the resurrection? Let's apply it personally. Again, well, first and foremost, that would mean the, there is power in Christ and his authority to truly forgive sins. And that's good news. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, he has forgiven all our sins and canceled every record of wrong that we owed. Christ has done away with it by nailing it to the cross. This is God's redemptive plan. He nailed it to the cross. Christ paid for our sins, our guilt, our shame. And that means we don't have to pay for it because he did it. He says he wants to cancel every record or wrong or sin that you've done. Canceled, finished, complete. That's good news. The point he is saying is that once God forgiven our sins we can forget it we can move on we can go on in our relationship with the lord and that's good news it would be worth just becoming a christian just to know that your sins are forgiven and you have a clean conscience just knowing that i'm free from those things that i've done wrong it's worth it just for that benefit alone that's good news no other religion or other program or system offers that And because Jesus is who he said he is, my past can be forgiven, and I don't have to carry the load of guilt or shame anymore. And that's one of the first things that many people do. When they surrender their life to Christ, they have this overwhelming sense of peace, the peace with God and the peace of God. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And listen, friends, you can walk out of here today knowing that every single thing that you've done wrong up to this point, can be completely forgiven. Because the tomb is empty and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, and that's good news. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, I come to save it. Jesus wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you. He wants to help you. He wants to give you a new beginning and a clear conscience. He wants a relationship with you. And no matter what our past is, no matter uh, how bad it may be, the gospel of Jesus Christ holds out hope for all. And that is something that the world needs to have is hope. But only hope in Jesus Christ will make the difference. All you have to do is confess your sins, and the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a glorious thing that the gospel of Jesus Christ is. The transformation that is brought by the gospel uh, to to bring those who are hopelessly lost and uh, in the power of darkness and sin. And as Jesus commanded and called the Apostle Paul in Acts 26, uh, 18, where he says, I have called you to go to the Gentiles to tell them to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. And that's what happens. It's like the light turns on when we receive Christ. And so ours is the most joyous, most blessed privilege of sharing with people the power of God to deliver them from the power of darkness and sin and to have forgiveness. Another key component of the resurrection is that you can have abundant life right now. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that more abundantly, as John 10.10 talks about. Again, we can't control everything that happens in our life, uh, but God can. He is sovereign. And so we want to connect with him and and, uh, and, uh, lean on him, trust in him. He's got the wisdom that we need, the guidance that we need, the provision that we need. And uh, when you talk to a lot of people, a lot of times you hear their complaints in life. You know, my life's a mess. It's out of control. And there's a lot of people that could identify with that. Uh, People still feel so powerless to change their situation. 
They feel powerless to break a habit. They feel powerless to, to save a relationship, powerless to get out of debt, or you, you name whatever problem that they have. They feel so empty, so powerless uh, to manage their time and schedules, and you name it. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, situations that people face. And what you need is a power greater than yourself, and that power is in Jesus Christ. Uh, it, again, we're not meant to admit this, our, our life alone, uh, on our own power, in our own strength. God wants you to have a relationship with you. He gives us everything that you need, you know, when you have this relationship with you. And listen, the same power that enabled Jesus to rise from the dead will help you rise above your problems, your circumstances, and your situation. You know, and then you start to realize that he's in control of everything, that he's sovereign. The things that I go through, you know, what some people meant for evil, he meant for good. All things work together for the good for those who love him, those who are called according to his purposes. You know, he's working all things out because he loves us. He, he knows what's best for us. The same power that God used at the resurrection time some 2,000 plus years ago can be in your life right now. As the Apostle Paul says in uh, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Again, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what is going to happen next week, next month, next year. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but it doesn't matter because when you're in that relationship with the Lord, he will take you one step at a time. You know, he's in control. He will give us the wisdom, the discernment, the grace, and the strength to face whatever we're in, uh, confronted with. So no matter how helpless or hopeless that you, you may be or your situation is, maybe you've come here crawling emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and, uh, and, and you're here today. Maybe you've had a tough week, and maybe you've had a tough season in life. Um, you know, God says to you, don't give up. Uh, no problem's too big for God. He can handle it. No situation is helpless if you turn it over to him. And because Jesus rose from the dead, I can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. We can have abundant life. But another component to this resurrection power is that it gives us a future and a hope. One of the universal problems is that we all um, are going to face death at some point. Everybody dies. Uh, I'm going to die someday. You're going to die if we're not raptured first, for those who are believers in Jesus Christ. It, and, and only a fool would actually go through life unprepared for something that's inevitable, that's going to happen to us. But yet some people, they wait till their deathbed before they turn their life over to Christ. But you never know when your time's up, when it's too late. So it doesn't make sense to wait too long. Sometimes we get so busy here and now that we don't stop and think, what's to come? What if I was to die today? What if I was to die tomorrow? Where am I going? You know, people don't like to talk about death. I invite you sometime, invite some people over and serve them some coffee and some cookies or whatever, and hey, let's talk about death. It's going to happen at some point, so let's talk about it. But everybody has that internal longing, what's going to happen? When I die, where am I going? Do I have the assurance of heaven? You know, we're only here for a period of time. You know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Uh, my wife's uh, grandpa is going to be turning 100 in a couple months' time. He's mentally sharp as a tack, but uh, physically he's decaying. He's falling apart. You know, it's just miserable, you know. But again, that's, that's a long time, here, 100 years. Um, but we don't know uh, when our time's up. But here's something for us to understand and to grasp, is that you're either going to spend eternity in heaven or you're going to spend eternity in hell. It all depends on what you do with Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line answer here. Who is, whose son is he? And there's a lot of misconception that people have of who Jesus is. They have a lot of misconception of what heaven's like. Uh, but the Bible says, again, heaven is a perfect place. Uh, total love, total peace, total joy, total perfection, no sin, no separation, no mistakes, no bad, no errors. It's a perfect place. Perfect in every way. In order to go there, you've got to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's it. It's that simple. It's not rocket science to put your faith in him. So he was the only one, Jesus Christ, that was perfect, who ever lived because he was God. And he came to reconcile us so we can have that right relationship with the Lord. 
He took upon our sin, we get his righteousness. What a, an amazing exchange that takes place there. The Bible says in John 17, 3, this is the way to have eternal life, by knowing the only true God in Jesus Christ, the one in whom he sent to earth. So the Bible says that Jesus had paid the way for heaven. He is our ticket. There's no other way that you get a ticket to heaven except through Jesus Christ. Christianity is not um, uh, somebody who accepts a religion. Christianity is somebody who has a relationship with God. And that's the difference between Christianity and every other religion out there. It's a relationship with God. A lot of people try to have all kinds of ways or think there's all kinds of ways to heaven. For example, some people try salvation by sincerity. As long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter. As long as you believe. Well, what's your belief in? And if you think this one through, you know, you can be sincerely wrong. There was a pilot that flew a, a plane into a, a, a mountain because uh, he was sincerely thought that the, they're flying at a higher level. He was sincere, but sincerely wrong. There's some people who think that they can get to heaven by good works and service. This is probably the number one aspect. Well, you've got to work your way to heaven. Uh, and, and you can do all these things and, and you work your way there, but what's the standard? You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. No service or works will get you into heaven. Otherwise, what's the point and purpose of Jesus coming to die for our sins and rising from the dead? There's also some would say, well, salvation by subtraction, meaning uh, you, you give up a bunch of things, you know, you... You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss, you don't chew, you don't run with the girls that do. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you don't do all these other things. If being a Christian was a matter of not doing certain things, then anybody who is dead qualifies to be a Christian then. They don't do anything. And then there's some people who think they'll go to heaven by ritual or by religion. Oh, if I get baptized... Uh, if you get baptized in the ocean, you know, where every, you know, and, and you can do it over and over and over where some people have that idea where every fish knows your, your first name. Or maybe you join a church and thinking that uh, that will make you a Christian. Well, sitting in church will not make you any more of a Christian than sitting into a, a car or a garage makes you a car. You know, if uh, you say, well, I joined a church. Well, you know, if you joined a Lions Club, does that make you a lion? If you were born into the church, you know, well, if you're born into a car, does that make you a spare tire? You know, there has to be this relationship that you have, not because you do certain things or rituals or religion get you into heaven. There's also some say, well, salvation by family. Uh, my, my mom and my dad, my brother, sister, they're saved, so I guess I'm covered. Uh, your grandmother was a Christian, you know, your grandparents, whatever. But you have to make a personal decision for yourself. It doesn't matter that my kids uh, think that, hey, my dad's a pastor, so I'm saved. No, they got to have their own relationship with the Lord. It's not based on their mom or dad. And then, of course, there's salvation by cons comparison. Oh, I'm better than so-and-so, you know, and, and, and maybe... You guys are a lot better than me. Uh, I don't doubt that. But uh, isn't judging, you know, according to one another not our standard? Christ is our standard. God doesn't grade on a curve. It's either perfection or nothing. As Jesus says, this is the way to eternal life. It's having that relationship with Christ and Christ alone. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we have been born again into a life full of hope through Christ rising from the dead. Hope doesn't mean that you have to fear anything. You don't have to fear death anymore. You can really live until you're, you're not afraid to die anymore. Now we, if something happens to me, hey, I get to be with the Lord. So I don't have to worry about, you know, situations. But my faith and my hope is in the Lord. And the question is, for some of you, is would you like to have all your sin, everything that you've done wrong, completely forgiven? Would you like to have a clear conscience? Would you like to have your future secure? 
to have that hope. And that's the difference that the resurrection makes in your life. How? Understanding the meaning and the power of the resurrection and why Christ rose from the dead and what difference it, it makes is not enough, though. You've got to act on it. So it's one thing to have the intellectual knowledge of this, but you've got to do something about it. You've got to take some action step. Understand that uh, what we've just talked about is not enough. You've got to accept it and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And no one can do that except yourself. No one can force you. You know, there's many people that came here today for different reasons, and, and, and they'll come to different churches, or they'll watch stuff and hear stuff online for different reasons. Uh, some, it's the thing to do because it's Easter. It's traditional. This is what everyone does. On Easter and Christmas, they go to church. Uh, some came because of habit. Some came because they were invited. You know, whatever the situation may be, you're not here by an accident. God brought you here so he can speak to you, so he can connect with you, so he can communicate with you, so he can get you to sit still, so he can tell you how much he loves you and he's got a plan for your life. God wants a relationship with us. And that's what Easter is about. God knows you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to come with an open heart to receive him as Savior and Lord. And again, the resurrection is that reminder of the proof of all that Christ has done for us. Some of you have been close to God in the past, and then some of you have drifted away. God wants to say to you to come back to him. And, and, and what God says to someone who has drifted away, he says, with deep love or with the compassion, I will come back to you. Nobody will love you as much as Jesus Christ does. No matter what you have done, he loves you with an everlasting love. You matter to God, and he brought you here today to tell you that. Jesus died for you to prove how much he loves you by the resurrection. And uh, again, we're all at different journeys in our walk with the Lord. And... Uh, some of you are not sure uh, that where you're going to go when you die. You need to make sure. You, you need to commit your life to the Lord, but no one can do that for you. No one's forcing you, but it would make sense to do it, to surrender your life to the Lord. And here's what some of you need to do. You need to surrender your life over to him. And you can pray something very simple. It's more of the attitude of your heart than the, the, the words that we're saying. Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. I realize I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin, and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I put my total trust in you. I want to follow you. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. It's that simple. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And for others who have drifted away, God is wanting to say to you, with deep love, I will draw you back. And here's what you could be saying to the Lord. Jesus, I'm coming home today. I want to get it in gear again, and I, I want to quit playing around and put first things first in my life. I surrender my life to you. And there are some that are just barely hanging on. And you've been so discouraged, so depressed, so discontent, and the pressures and the stresses have been building up and uh, in your life in the past week or however long it has been, and you feel overwhelmed. And the Lord would say to you, give it all to me. Surrender it all. Let it go. Let me work in your life. And as Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So no matter what you're facing or what you're going through right now, would you give that matter? Would you give that situation and surrender that to the Lord? And may he give you the peace and the strength and the wisdom and the grace that you need and the rest that you need because of the power of the resurrection, because the tomb is empty and he is risen from the dead. And may you experience the power of the resurrection today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you that we have the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life through a personal love relationship with you. For those who are not saved today, or maybe they've drifted away, that they would come back to you, that you would save them, 
that you would set them free from any bondage that is holding them back and that they would experience the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We know that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we come to you right now. We come to the cross. We surrender all. We want to follow you and, and live our lives dedicated to you and telling others about you. And so I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to those that are here today and those that are watching online, that you would save them. And as the word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I pray that you would make those commitments today. And Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you bless your precious people in Jesus' name. Amen.